well, and uh, we're really excited. I think I, Tim would agree with me uh, to tackle a subject that is near and dear to both of our hearts, and it you know it's something we deal with on a regular basis, which is in relation to running podcasts and having people approach us being, about being on said podcast. Uh, so Tim, I know you're in the same place as me. Uh, we get this happening a lot. And so I think, thought it'd be cool, and, and you, you actually brought it up, and I thought it'd be cool, I agree with you, to chat about our experience in being pitched and then what we see that works and even maybe what we've had work for us whenever we're go- maybe wanting to get on the show or, yeah. or approach somebody about their show. Yeah, exactly. Would you agree with that, Tim? Yeah, for sure. And we've both been in, we've both done both of those things. Eh? So, because the thing is that the first point that I really wanted to get across, Corey, is, is that, um, you know, I'd like to think we're nice people and I think most podcast hosts are. Um, in our hearts, we want to say yes. Like, you know, when we get a pitch, when somebody reaches out to us and, and, and we want to say yes, I mean, I'm going in with that desire, but then there's the reality that there's only so many slots in a, you know, in a year. I'm really, I'm, I'm a little more prolific right now in terms of the number of shows I'm putting out, but, but there's still a limited number of slots. And even more important than that, you know, we've got this, this commitment to our listeners, you know, that people are, you know, we've made a, we have a pact with them. You know, they tune in once or twice or three or, in my case, seven days a week. Um, and if they're subscribing to that show and they're downloading it, they're expecting, you know, something that they can, you know, that fits with the tone of what we're trying to accomplish and it's inspiring and, and you know, and all of those kind of things. So, um, you know, I think, but I think the other thing, look, maybe throw it back to you, because I think the thing that people really also need to come to grips with is just how time consuming the process of, of both getting the pictures and just recruiting guests in, in general can can be. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, on one hand, you mentioned getting the pitches. And, you know, now I would say, just to give people a, a point of reference, I would say I'm getting pitched probably about I was telling you that I, I think 20 that I know of, and when I say that, some don't even make it to my main inbox because of something they put in the email, and other ones I, I gl- glaze past and think it's a new- newsletter from somebody else because they do have a lot of emails coming in, and so I probably missed some. So I'm going to say realistically probably between 30 and 40, I would say a week. So if, yeah, so and, and usually I don't get them much on the weekend. So if you, if you crunch the numbers, that's eight a day. And you were just telling me somebody you talked to is getting 400 a week. And so people don't realize, as you said, Tim, how time consuming it even is for me to go through just those 20 that I do focus in on and go through them all and try to find that one diamond in the rough. And so it's a time consumption from my side. And then, like you said, it's theirs as well. They're putting the time together to send that out. Even if they're doing a standard email that they're sending to everybody, they're still taking the time to send that out. Hopefully they're customizing it a little bit. Maybe they're saying my name at least. And then we both put in all that time, but, and this is something I know you and I chatted about, are they actually putting in the time to figure out if they're the right fit for my show and your show? Or are they just kind of throwing a dart at the wall and hoping they get a balloon? And I would argue that that it's it makes sense to especially if you're approaching a show because you they've been on your radar you've maybe seen them somewhere they come across on linkedin someplace uh, if you're approaching a show like that why not take even 20 minutes to listen to one episode and the episode might be an hour but 20 minutes to listen to a part of an episode i think you'll learn a lot about screw the naysayers your podcast and what the theme and approach is rather than spending you know half that time just throwing a dart at a bloom that's yeah. my take on it yeah i i, I agree and you know i mean so because because, you know, as we talked about this before as well, like, you know, um, I, I in the last couple of weeks, I got quite a few requests that just just came in. And, you know, one of them that just crossed my desk, I mean, the approach was, uh, um, I think I would be a great fit for your show. And I'm, that's great. You, you know, you that means you're doing most of the work for me because you've already figured it out. But this is going to lead to a very obvious question, which is why? <laughs> like, why do you think you're a good fit? And I'm telling you what, if you aren't able to come back with a very succinct clear answer at that stage i'm probably going to start tuning you out you know it's you know it really it's almost a sign of i don't like to get hung up on respect but i mean it's like um whereas i've got other folks that say look I, i'm not sure i think it might be a good fit but i mean here's here's my story and they can net it out in one message in messenger or you know a short email uh, a note on LinkedIn or something like that. And, you know, let me know if you think it's a it's a good fit. I mean, um, all you have to do in that first message is be good enough to cause us to think this might be, and we, we'll probably get a dialogue going, or we'll go to your social media or, 
you know, or whatever. But it's the kiss of death to get overconfident and say, hey, Corey, man, I just know I'm the right, pro you know, and you know who you got lined up for next week. And you're sort of comparing the two buyers and you're thinking, well, yeah, no. <laughs> you know? Well, I think another great point to that is, you know, your show uh, relates to naysaying and naysayers. My show relates to influencers. It's in our titles. And what surprises me and this is maybe a lesson for people, but what surprises me is people saying, I'm a good fit for your show, and they don't even say the word influences in it, or they don't even say, explain why they're an influencer. Even just talk about, you know, I know your show's about influencing, and, and if they listen to the show, they'd say, I know you also talk about purpose and passion and legacy and all those other things. But even on the core level, with it in the title, if you're going to, like you say, be brave enough to say, I'm a good fit, at least mention the, the theme of our show, or like in your case saying, you know, I've had so many naysayers in my life say this about me, at least say that. And you know what? If, if they didn't listen to your show, maybe the naysayers was a trick title, maybe it didn't have anything to do with that, that they would get caught up. But nine times out of 10, if they're going to just do it boldly anyway, they'd still be safer to mention naysayers. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, for sure. Approaching you. Yeah, for, you know, for sure. And, you know, and, you know, the other thing that, that, that I'm just really, um, um, I guess I, you know, frustrated would be the, you know, the, 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 you know, the best way of saying it is that when, when you get these, these, these pictures coming in and, and everybody gets so caught up in their story. And look, you, you know, it's true that, you know, you know, when you're up on a stage that it has to be, you have to have a story, but everybody has a story. And if you really want to get down to the depths of it, there's only three or four or seven, depending on what philosophy you want to, uh, you know, uh, subscribe to, but there's a very limited number of human stories that are actually out there. Um, it's what you've done with your story. You know, it's, and it, and it's, the, and it's not just that you survived some adversity. So in my case, screwing the naysayers is usually either overcoming adversity that people said, well, you're never going to do that. You'll never be able to, you know, rise from that challenge or whatever. Um, um, or it, you know, or, or it's, it's, uh, you've got this big dream and they tell you you can't do it, but there's, a million people that have done it, or 10 million, or 100 million, a billion. I mean, it's a huge world. What have you done with it? And so the other thing that I really, like, I almost instantly, I wouldn't, like, some of the emails you described as being, as you know, taking 10 minutes to read, I wouldn't even have gone that far before I would have been on their LinkedIn profile. That's the other thing I want to say to people. If they are not conscious of what LinkedIn is, you know, doing in this podcasting space right now, then they're missing such an obvious opportunity. And actually, most of the legitimate uh, contacts that I've made in terms of guests have taken place on the LinkedIn platform. You know, people have read my profile. They comment on my posts, or they call, better still, they comment on my show. Like on LinkedIn, I put up uh, seven days a week, I put up a 60-second clip on LinkedIn that, that is a, a clip from my show of that day. And so if you want to get on my radar, instead of sending me a, a, a random email from somebody I don't know, go over to LinkedIn, look up my, my daily post and start commenting. Oh, that's a good episode. And, but not just say that's a good episode, but I could really relate to this because this is how my story. And you know what? Do that for three or four days in a row and then send me a friend request. Well, now we're going to I'm going to connect with you, guaranteed, because I read every comment that people make on my show. I mean, that's 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 where I live. Eh? Um, this stuff just seems so basic, but I'll go over to LinkedIn and I'll see like one post in the last six months or the thing that I, I did. oh man, would people stop posting quotes of inspirational uh, quotes from somebody else? Like if you can't even come up with some, enough original content to make your own post, what are you going to say to my guests? Or what are you going to tell my guests? You know? Yeah, it's such a great point. And I'll add in, Tim, too, that because I, I always think consciously, OK, if I were listening to these two guys chat about what's a good way to get on shows, what's a better approach. One of the things that I think is is um, worth adding in there is you and I both are on LinkedIn a lot. So I'm not certainly going to say uh, I'm not going to say don't go that direction whatsoever. But what I'll add to is if let's say because there's the other side is we get we get told, you know, pick your pick your area. So if LinkedIn's your area, awesome. But then we got somebody like Shalene Johnson. I don't know if you're familiar with Shalene, uh, but she's uh, people would know her from either creating Turbo Jam, the, that uh, fitness product or uh, being a um a top podcaster. She's a mega influencer on Twitter, probably 200,000 followers over, I think close to a million now on Facebook. But here's the thing. Instagram is her baby. So if you go over to Instagram, you'll see like 200,000. Yes, she's on LinkedIn, but I don't think she's on there as often. So to that point, Tim, I think you definitely, and, and you know what, they might, some of them might lose you because LinkedIn's your baby, but 
at the end of the day, they got to be somewhere. I think that's the takeaway from this. But here's the other point I would, I am on, I am on Instagram. I'm not nearly as active there, but guess what? I hardly get any messages there either because I'm not that active. So if you actually hit me up on LinkedIn, you're at, you're going to get a reply. So and you're going to get noticed. Yeah, you would actually get noticed. You're going to get noticed in my case, just because I'm sort of, obs- you know, this is my life these days. But no, I agree. And it's, it's not, I mean, I, um, I don't, I think to, to have only one place would be, you actually, if you want to get on the show, you need to figure out where that person's hanging out. And, and again, it's, 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 um, if you were applying for a job, I mean, it's, I'm, I don't want to overstate what can happen, but you and I both know that that crazy things can happen if you can start to get on to 15 or 20 podcasts or three or four of the uh, of higher profile podcasts and it gets shared around. Amazing things can happen to people's brands. So don't don't take it lightly. You got a chance to pitch Corey. Well, you'd better be you giving it your best shot because he's got a big audience. You know, your life could change. What are you going to do? Just, you know, flippantly send something off and leave all the work to, you know, at our end? You know, I mean, I'm a little surprised you don't even have other people screening all your, you know, your and, you know, your stuff, because um, that's common, probably. <laughs> yeah. It, well, yeah, it, there's a that's that's there's, there's a whole big discussion behind that as well of how uh, it, it just even how much I'm handling now, which is how much I have to make that change soon. But I, I, I always kind of subscribe to listening to Brendan Burchard talk about how he managed everything until his, he was that $10 million a year business. And so sometimes, sometimes you hear that and you go, oh, well, if Brendan could do it. But, but to your point though, uh, Tim, I think there's, there's some powerful lessons there. Uh, so when we talk about what can happen, I'll give you two real time examples. One is a, a client of mine. So I know he'd be cool with me mentioning this. Uh, well, I'll just go this far and say he has a remote reception company. So they handle calls, but they do it. And he's in Nova Scotia and they do it with a smile. So if you know who they are, that might give you a hint. But the point is, uh, he told me that he actually had a company and I got to get this testimonial from him. But from listening to our episode, they had a company reach out, told them that's how they discovered him and offered to buy his company. And I'm talking, um, I'll just say that, I, and I didn't, we, him and I didn't have a, a follow up conversation because they put the offer out, but it was a verbal and all that stuff. So he was waiting to see what the final offer was. But I'm, I think, I think we're talking a multi million dollar deal from being on one episode of our show. Now, that's, that's, you know, on the side of being on our show. But I'll tell you one real time example of my, uh, you know, me being on a show as a guest, Entrepreneurs on Fire, which I'm sure you're quite familiar with. So I visited the show twice and the, uh, from both actually, I've had, it's amazing how many reach outs I've had from those two appearances, but one in particular was a publishing company. And we got to the point where they put an offer, two different separate offers on the table to me. And the way they discovered me was through uh, seeing that I was one of the only people that were on, was on the show twice. So he saw my first one and then happened to search the name and said, Oh, he's got two. And he's a big time listener to the show and said, most people don't have two. So to your point, it's like with LinkedIn, there's something magical in the profile. Well, it's the same thing. If you've been on the show twice, they're going, well, I bet John must, John Lee Dumas must have vetted this guy. You know, why, why is he on twice? And then they pay more attention. So to your point, Tim, not saying that happens, obviously, every visit to a show, but that's what can happen. And so why would you, as you mentioned, take it lightly? Yeah, no, it is. So, I mean, I think just maybe to, to sort of wrap it up, I mean, I, or sum it up, I mean, I think it's about being prepared. I think the other last point I would make is that we didn't talk about it too much, but I mean, when you can get introductions, man, that means such. Like, you know, I both, uh, we talked about this, but I mean, we got all these these people to scream, screen or something, but, uh, you know, if you uh, pop me an email and say, Tim, I just talked to so-and-so, and, and she would be just an amazing fit to your show. I'm going to take you pretty at uh, 99% at face value. I mean, I'll look at it because that's just me. But, um, you know, um, so, you know, find ways to get introduced because we're all pretty out, uh, active out there. And, you know, you, you look at somebody else who was a past guest. I mean, maybe you can, you can, you know, there's, there's all sorts of ways of doing it. It's not like uh, um, if you're trying to get on Tim Ferriss's show or whatever, or I don't even know the re-interviews, I don't know how to advise you. Like they're, they're up in another Gary V. They're up in another planet, you know, compared to, you know, what, what, you know, what I'm doing. But most of us, I mean, we're just ordinary people. And, um, you know, we got profiles out there. But an introduction, a reference, or a past, you know, leveraging a past, uh, um, you know, a past show you might have been on, you know, where I got something to go listen to. That's the other thing I'm looking for is YouTube. I go to, you know, YouTube. If your name doesn't come up with some image, you know, in that Google search with some video or something, again, it just causes me to think, well, like, I don't know about you. I'm not fixated on the number. I don't go and look how many followers you have or any of that kind of stuff. But I do want to see if anybody's aware of you. Because if if they're not, then it means you're not having any kind of impact. You know. So 
a couple of things I wanted to add on to, to there as well, Tim. Uh, so one thing you said, which I think is a good takeaway for people, is if you're not searchable right now, figure out how to become searchable. Uh, the referral side, I'll tell you, the reason I brought up all those messages that come in, those long messages, uh, I don't read them as much as I used to, but I brought them up because what's the alternative? It's important we tell them that, and you mentioned that, is how do you get a referral? So here's what I would add. And by the way, I would even add to the Gary Vee, the Tim Ferrises. I mean, they're, a, they're in a scenario where they got such a backlog, even of introductions, that they can't even jump anybody in the queue. But go one level below that, and really where does it start? Is you go on to LinkedIn, Twitter, what have you, and start sharing their stuff. And if you wanna get on their radar, take quotes from their book. They almost all have a book, and say, love this quote by Gary Vee, and share that. And if you do that enough times, even Gary Vee will notice. He might not put you on the show, but he'll eventually retweet that. Uh, the referral side, I would say go listen to, go look at your show, and at very least, scroll down to see who the guests are. You might be surprised. You might have some indirect connection to one of those guests, and what I would do then is say, can you do me a favor and introduce me to Tim? Like, meaning yourself, Tim, not Tim Ferriss. But, and so that's one option. Another thing is if you do get on that one show that you mentioned where they can connect you, maybe you ask that podcast or reach back out to them and say, hey, say they were on your show. You know, Tim, I'm trying to get on so-and-so show, and I noticed you were on there or what have you, or just in general, you're a podcaster, they're a podcaster. Uh, do you know them? Um, another thing is, here's, a, here's this podcaster, this, our community is really small. And so even though there's a lot of podcasters, it's a small community. And so another thing you could do is if you were bold enough is start your own monthly podcast and just do one show a month. And if you want to get on a big person show, invite them onto your show first. You, they'll don't get to know you more, all that kind of stuff. Uh, that's another thing. Uh, I would say be creative in your pitches. So I'll give you an example of something I did. I wanted to be on a show called The One Thing, which is a, a really big show built around a book called The One Thing. And when I approached them, uh, I mean, without going into my the pitch side of it, when I approached them, uh, they came back to me and said, what do you know about our book? Have you read our book? And so I, what worked out really well for me is I was on the road. I had the book home. I didn't have it on the road with me. So I said, I want to be on the show in a big way. It's worth a $20 investment. So I went and bought another copy of the one thing at uh, local chapters. I already had read the book. I knew it was inside of it. But then I had a conference going on. I was speaking to 200 people, I think. And uh, I get a picture. I could even post it here if we do uh, any kind of show notes or something with me like this, holding the book. And this is for the one thing. That's the thing that they used to do for their symbol. And I had everybody there grouped into the picture doing the same thing. I said that, that not only have I read the book, I've introduced it to 200 people just today. Anyway, I was I was booked on the show within about five minutes, and I'm not joking. Like what they they read the message and they said, "Just read your message. Uh, let's make it happen." And what I'm saying is, it's just a creative way rather than, "Hey, here's the two-page summary of who I am." Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention, and you know, if you have anything else you want to mention, um, I would say two things. Like, make sure to include things like if you've written for, and that's why it's worth going out of your way to write for somebody like Forbes or Entrepreneur or get a TEDx talk. Is to your point, that's going to make you shine over somebody else immediately because a book these days, as you said, doesn't stand out as much as it used to. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention is whenever I get approached by people, another frustrating thing for me is whenever they don't have a headshot. And so this is something that uh, was kind of a thorn in my side. Uh, do I have any? Yes. So the book uh, that I, last book I put out, you know about this book, Tim, the book of why. In the back, we have pictures of thought leaders and their quotes. You wouldn't believe even more so than this book, but this book, not as much, but I had five books before this uh, around the region where we live, Conversations With, they were called, and it was like pulling teeth. I had, say, two, 200 people in a book, and I bet you only 40 had solid photo, like solid uh, headshots at a high quality that they could send me. People were sending me pictures from them at the bar and saying, can you crop this and do work with it? <laughs> the point is, people don't have headshots. Don't, you're not, my opinion on that is you're not ready to approach the media, including new media, meaning podcasters, if you don't have a headshot. So another takeaway is get your headshot. I mean, we're only covering the, scratching the surface here, but get a headshot. Too. Yeah. I think the last point out, because it really ropes right into that one is uh, for those that don't know what a one sheet is, you know, just Google it or something. But one sheet, I mean, it should, it should have that headshot in it as well. A, a picture of you, it should have a one paragraph bio of, you know, what you're, you're most known for and then topics that, you know, that, uh, that Corey can speak on. Four or five of the, you know, the key topics that you like to talk on. Put some catchy titles to it, but be clear enough that people can understand what that is and some, you know, some contact information. That's enough. One thing I'll add is, uh, 
if you can learn about, and I'm happy to, if people want to reach out to me, tell them more about this, but if you can learn about a thing called the dip method, and, and it's not, and it's known, it's not like it's just something that is only proprietary to me, but the media used it for years and just doesn't anymore. But as speakers, I use it and I teach it all the time. If you can learn about the dip method and you can approach somebody like me or Tim about being on our show, using your dip method and knowing how to share it. And you and I talked about it a little bit. You talked about, do you know how you've used your story and how your stories change lives? If you can learn about the dip method, that's going to take you light years ahead of most people pitching podcasters so if you want to know more about it reach out to me and i'll explain that too but yeah i mean it's it's all comes down to being creative and approaching people in the right way Corey, for folks that want to catch up with the speaking guy yeah absolutely and that that's a good segue right there because i always i mean i have many hubs where people can reach me uh but the easiest one by far is that speakerguy.com first of all it's easy to remember but secondly on there you can find all, like you can find the links to our shows, you can find the um, my TEDx talks, all those kind of things. But also social media, the links are on there, so you can reach out and connect further. And then I would also say um, that our shows, likewise, are on all the usual channels, usual suspects, if you will. Uh, but if you reach out to me on that thatspeakerguy.com, that'll take you wherever you need to go because you can find most of it on there, or you can ask me a question and say, "How do I get this?" and I'll do my best to serve you.